And good afternoon, Molecular Genetics fans. So we were talking about prokaryotic transcription last time, and we're now going to talk about eukaryotic transcription. Now, here's a key point to keep in mind. In the prokaryotic world, the RNA polymerase has an intrinsic binding affinity to DNA, which makes sense for an RNA polymerase. Uh, we're going to see that eukaryote, uh, the eukaryotic RNA polymerase doesn't bind to DNA very well. It doesn't have an intrinsic binding affinity. Now, with the prokaryotic system, we have the alpha 2, beta, beta prime, and then the addition of sigma factor causes it to actually have very high affinity, spe sequence specific binding affinity to a promoter. Once transcription starts, the sigma factor can diffuse away and the core enzyme can continue on with transcription. All right, that's going to key be a key point in uh, prokaryotic uh, transcription control because if you put some kind of blocking molecule on top of the promoter, the RNA polymerase can't bind. All right, well, now, in the eukaryotic world, as we're about to see, the RNA polymerase doesn't have binding affinity to DNA. It has a binding affinity to a set of proteins that we call the basal transcription apparatus, a whole set of proteins that are going to bind themselves to the promoter and then that allows the RNA polymerase to kind of have its little nest to bind into it. So that means that what we're going to be looking at in terms of eukaryotic uh, transcription control is going to be focusing on a lot of transcription factors. So uh, this is a typical gene. We've got a sequence known as an enhancer and this is just a sequence that binds transcription factors and typically in terms of enhancers the transcription factors are going to aid in establishing this nest that the RNA polymerase can bind into um, and so without enhancers uh, genes don't fire very well then we're going to have a separation and this actually separation can be um, thousands of nucleotides between the enhancer and the core promoter at the core promoter, it's around 100 base pairs, and there are a set of sequences that are quite conserved, and this is what binds what we call the basal transcription apparatus, and then it establishes plus one, where the RNA polymerase is going to start transcribing. So, uh, when we look at RNA polymerase in yeast, there's actually a, uh, a number of proteins that are similar to the bacterial protein. So we've got a subunit that is related to the alpha subunit. We've got uh, subunits related to the beta subunit. So there's multiple subunits. Now, a point, and I don't really have the board to write on at the moment, but it's all right. Uh, one of the other things that's key in the eukaryotic world is we don't have a single RNA polymerase. We've got three. We have Paul one, Paul two, Paul three. And just because I'm gonna flip the screen up. And I'm just gonna very quickly do a little board thing. This is one of my uh, mnemonic tricks for keeping track of RNA polymerase types. And it's something we go over when we're talking about uh, doing MCAT review. And so feel free to use this as a way of keeping up with what polymerase does what. So we have three RNA polymerases and I always think about my experience with RNA gels. RNA gels aren't typically done these days. Most of the time we're not still using, uh, we use PCR. But when you run an RNA gel, you isolate RNA from a typical cell. And what you're going to see is kind of a smear of RNA that represents the messenger RNAs of a variety of sizes. What you really see in a very strong signal is two bands that represent the large and small subunit of the ribosomal RNA and then a diffuse band way down here that is representing the tRNA. So we got ribosomal RNA tRNA. And the way I always keep in mind is sort of think about their order on the gel. In that this is the domain of Paul 1. The messenger RNA is the domain of Paul 2. 
and the smallest guy, tRNAs, this is the domain of Paul 3. Now, Paul 1 and Paul 3 are busy expressing RNA all the time. Paul 1 is responsible for the nucleolus. And so there's a lot of ribosomal RNA uh, transcription going on. Paul 3 is responsible for producing tRNAs. Lots of stuff happening there. Paul 2 is responsible for producing messenger RNA. This is really important because not all cells had the same messenger RNA population. We, of course, have what we call the housekeeping genes, little guys sweeping up and doing careful painting. These are all your biochemistry uh, metabolic pathway genes. They're on all the time, what we consider to be constitutive. But then we're going to have tissue and cell-specific genes that are expressed in very tightly, very carefully regulated, and these are the really cool Paul II genes. So we'll look a little bit at Paul I and Paul III, mainly to say they're weird oddballs, not mess with them. Paul II is where we're going to be really putting our attention. So when we start thinking about um, the different polymerases, and what the heck, I'll go back to some figures here. Paul 1 and Paul 3 actually have some non-standard organizations of their promoters, as we're about to see here in a moment. Um, they've got some uh, different kinds of symptoms, uh, systems and that they are being expressed all the time. So um, the RNA polymerase 1 holoenzyme has a, a number of core binding proteins and binding factors. The uh, promoter for Paul 1, that is the promoter that is driving um, large and small ribosomal RNA subunit uh, production, is got uh, sort of an odd little structure to it in that we have a core promoter, there's an upstream promoter element, but these guys are on all the time. Just to make a little note, this is something called Tata binding protein. We're going to see that in Paul 2, and it's, so it's present as well. Again, we're establishing this nest that allows the RNA polymerase to bind. Uh, that's about all I have to say about uh, Paul 1. Paul 3 is uh, another oddball. This is the RNA polymerase that is driving tRNA production. There are a couple of different tRNA type genes. Uh, some of them actually have what is known as sort of a bipartite or split enhancer, and that there are sequences here actually in the transcribed region that are part of the promoter. It's odd. I ain't going to talk about it any further. There we go. Now, um, so this is like the internal uh, type 2 Paul 3 promoters. Yeah, whatever. Um, oddballs. What we want to talk about is Paul 2. This is really where all the action is. So this is what a Paul 2 promoter looks like. Most of the uh, RNA polymerase 2 genes are going to have this TATA or Tata box region. Uh, there are some that don't have a Tata box, but those are oddballs. I ain't gonna talk about them either. So, a minimal Paul II promoter is gonna have uh, this minus 25 sequence, this Tata box. And then there's a couple of uh, initiating spots as well that are conserved. RNA pol polymerases then for Paul II are being positioned by um, a multiple set of transcription factors of the basal transcription apparatus. One of the biggies is a factor called Tata binding protein. Tata binding protein is a component of um, part of the transcription factor basal apparatus that are designated as TFs, which is transcription factor, and then you have the polymerase designator. So. Um, for Paul 3, you have TF3s. For Paul 1, they don't really have TF1s, but that's what it would be called. Paul 2, we've got TF2s. TF2A, TF2B, TF2C. TF2D is the critical transcription factor kind of complex that is aligning everything up with the Tata box. So TF2D has a protein known as Tata binding protein that actually recognizes that TATA region. RNA polymerase 2 now has binding affinity to this TF complex. So 
Um, here's how Tata binding protein is actually binding. Um, one of the things we're going to start looking at with transcription factors is they typically have some fairly canonical and conserved structures that allow them to bind DNA. And so we can actually classify transcription factors, which we'll get into when we start thinking about uh, tissue-specific gene expression. Um, so we're establishing what is known as an initiation complex. And it is um, a whole set of these TFs. And so there's TF2D, which is interacting, and then a number of other uh, TF2s are coming in here. One of the things that starts to happen is there's a tail protein of RNA, on the RNA polymerase that has to be phosphorylated. That phosphorylation is essentially saying, all right, you're set, you're ready to go, get moving. And that phosphorylation event actually is going to trigger a few other downstream things like the steps involved in, pro in RNA processing. So um, TF2B is another one of these guys that's binding DNA, contacting um, RNA polymerase. And uh, yeah. so anyway, this is a little slide that's showing the RNA polymerase to uh, the carboxy terminal domain, or the CTD, is phosphorylated, and that is essentially establishing uh, some of the other factors for processing. It's bringing in the polyadenylation system. It's also bringing in the five prime cap system. All right, now the really critical cool thing that I wanna stress here is the role of the enhancer. Enhancers are DNA sequences that bind transcription factors that are gonna allow for a much higher binding affinity for the RNA polymerase. It's gonna establish kind of a better nest. Now, <coughs> I'll edit that sneeze out. <coughs> uh, but I won't edit that sneeze out. I'm not gonna edit it. All right, so um, the enhancer is a binding site for transcription factors, we can make a very distinct definition that distinguishes between an enhancer and a promoter. A promoter is always going to be position specific to transcription start. That is, it's defining, it's defining where plus one is. An enhancer, on the other hand, actually can be really up and down the genome. It can be way far away. Uh, even up to like 50,000 nucleotides away and still have its effect. Additionally, enhancers can be on either side of the transcription unit. So that means that promoters are both position specific and distance specific. Enhancers are neither. They are not position specific nor are they distance, independent, distance dependent. So Transcription factors that bind to enhancers are essentially folding the DNA up to allow for a happier nest for the RNA polymerase. Um, and so there's been a number of different kinds of experiments done that demonstrate how, in fact, enhancers can bind um, the, or once they have their binding proteins, they can interact with other parts of the DNA and kind of fold things up. Is that the last one? It can't be. I guess it is. All right, so that gets us into the next set of uh, discussion points, which we will pick up, um, well, for the last set of lectures, and that is going to be the control of gene expression in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and we'll see where we go from there. All right, that's about all I know, and... Uh, I'll talk with you cats later. Thanks for your patience and we will talk soon.